So, hi everybody, and welcome to today's Tech Talk. Um, Sebastian will be talking about automated citations in Wikipedia, uh, Cytoid, and the technology behind it. Uh, go ahead, Sebastian. Yeah. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Thank you very much for having me and for putting this together. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Sebastian Karcher. My uh, main profession is actually uh, as a, da a data archivist at uh, Syracuse University, uh, but I also maintain the translators for the Zotero Reference Manager, which is how I uh, get uh, into this talk. And uh, to get you a sense of why what we're talking about today is, is, is cool and why it's important and why it relates to Wikipedia, I'm just going to start with a quick uh, demo. I'm going to start appropriately on my user sandbox uh, rather than on a real Wikipedia page. But uh, as I start editing and the visual editor loads, if you don't have the visual editor, you can enable that somewhere here on the right side. Uh, you know, you can uh, start uh, writing an article. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can uh, start citing something. So let's say you did some research, you found an article in the New York Times, that's really important. And then you want to cite this. And uh, for those who remember the old days, you had to fill out like a complicated citation uh, template, and et, et cetera. And now you just click on the cite button you have up here. You paste your URL in here, click Generate. It will take a little time. And it will give you a preview of the citation. And you click Insert. And there you go. Uh, and you can do that from a ton of different sites. For, so for example, um, if you are more academically inclined, you go to the JSTOR archive um, of articles. It's the same story. Um, site, input URL, generate. It gives you the whole citation. You click Insert. And then once you save the page, uh, you get your fully formatted, beautiful, beautiful citations at the bottom here. And that was super quick and painless. And that's the technology I want to uh, be talking about uh, today. Um, some uh, preliminaries, uh, I should say. Uh, questions. I'm obviously super happy about questions. Uh, they should mostly go through the IRC chat. Uh, and then someone in the uh, Wikimedia office will read them to me. And you should free to ask them at any time during the talk. I'm happy to be interrupted, to clarify, to repeat things, etc. cetera. Um, and the second thing is uh, as you think about as you think about kind of expectations, I was thinking about kind of a three-tiered structure of expectations. So if you're just kind of generally interested in how this all works, you can you know lean back, relax, and kind of just see some cool tech at work. And I'm hoping to make this entertaining enough for you to be uh, worth it. If you are kind of interested in dabbling, but you don't really are a coder, you don't know much about how this technology works, my hope is that this gives you enough of a structure and, in the end, enough links to resources that you can start you know, reading up, practicing a little bit, and eventually get yourself in a position uh, to actually help contribute and improve these features. And kind of the third tier, if you already know some JavaScript, maybe know what an XPath is, are familiar with regular expressions, uh, then you might be able to just actually go ahead and write uh, your own Zotero and then Wikipedia uh, functioning uh, code right after uh, this webinar. So this is kind of the three layers that I'm thinking of. Uh, now, you will have heard me mentioning uh, Zotero repeatedly. So w what is Zotero, and why am I talking about it? Zotero is actually its own software that hundreds and thousands of academics use. It's a reference manager software developed at uh, George Mason University in, uh, in Virginia. It's uh, based on the Mozilla framework, so it's originally just a Firefox extension. Now it also exists in standalone. And uh, it's uh, free and open source under, under a GPL license. Um, now the feature that you just saw me demonstrate uh, is referred to as, as Cytoid. Um, and what that essentially does is it connects Wikipedia to a Zotero that runs on the server. 
So if I were running Zotero on my own computer, I would just be clicking a button and importing those items into my own database. And what Sitehost cleverly does is it runs Zotero effectively on a server and um, then uses the same technology, but instead of importing it into my local database where I keep my you know, academic references, it passes it on to Wikipedia. And uh, for those of you on the Google Hangout, uh, and we actually have the developer of Cytoid uh, along. So Mariel Waltz uh, wrote this whole thing, and and it's a really cool code and a really cool extension of you know taking advantage of open source software and shows the benefits of of what that can do. Um, great. So. As I mentioned at the beginning, I actually have relatively little involvement in Cytoid apart from you know, occasionally helping out uh, when a, a user reports a bug in Zotero. My main interest and my main knowledge and why I'm talking to you today is the Zotero part. So I'm going to talk to you about um, Zotero translators. And um, those are the little files, and I'm going to talk more about those later. Those are the little files uh, that actually help Wikipedia understand all those different uh, sites that people uh, want to or may want to cite in Zotero. If you, um, if you want to be uh, following along or if you want to work with this, there's three pieces of software that you need. The first one is the Firefox browser. Uh, as a development environment, uh, that's, uh, that's really your only good option. Uh, here, uh, you will need the Zotero Reference Manager, which, and in this case, you should be installing the Firefox add-on version of that. And then you will need uh, a, the tool that's called Scaffold, um, that has the um, that has the I'm sorry, uh, that that is set, sort of an IDE, so so it helps us more easily develop. Um, those Zotero translators. And at this point, I should briefly mention that I have all the links that I have on these slides here, I put on my web page. So that's uh, sebastiancarcher.com slash link list. Uh, and so you can follow along. Right here were the initial links. There's some site out documentation. And now we're here uh, at the development environment. And as I scroll down, uh, every link that I'll have on my slides and a bunch of additional ones will be uh, on this uh, on this link list. So that's in case you can't read it, sebastiancarcher.com, so my name, dot com, slash link list. Um, great. So Zotero translators. Um, it's relatively simple. There's all individual small little files. And uh, every one of those files is written in JavaScript. And most of the files, uh, and the only ones that we're going to talk about really today, are in this first category, what we refer to as web translators. Uh, so they import sources from the web. And most typically, uh, one file, one translator, will refer to a single uh, web page. In some cases, we have translators that refer to a whole family, say, a specific content management system, or something like that. Uh, and in some cases, and we actually will look at this, one of those web translators uh, will actually call on yet another translator uh, that uh, has knowledge of a specified format, be it RAS, which is a common um, metadata format, format for academics, but also a lot of the different formats that can be uh, embedded in the headers of uh, websites, which is probably most interesting uh, for people developing for Wikipedia. and. Um, the most common thing that uh, though that that you'll probably want to be working on is uh, web translators that we refer to as scrapers. So what they do is they take data off that is already visible on the web page, but they extract it in a systematic way. What's the author? What's the date? What's the title? Etc. Um, and then pass it on to Zotero if you're writing for Zotero, and then to Citoid and your Wikipedia citations uh, once that's implemented. Uh, and there's a full list of all the translators that are currently available. It's uh, somewhere uh, uh, be somewhere above 300 and uh, covering literally thousands of different sites because, again, some of them are, are relatively general in nature. Um, I don't 
have the time to go in depth on all the technology that I'm uh, going to be using, on all the tools that I'm going to be using. But the most important tool uh, that we'll be talking about um, are XPaths. And XPaths are mostly used actually in, in XML, but we're going to be talking about them in the contents of websites and web pages. And uh, the way I think about XPaths, Past, and I'm not a computer scientist, so, so there might be some imprecision in terminology here. Uh, but the way I think about them uh, is, is uh, as directions to a specific part of a web page. Um, remember, if you've ever looked at a web page, and if you've never done so, you can, uh, in your browser, just press Control u or Command u if you're on a Mac and see the entire code of any uh, website or web page you're looking at. Um, it's just built up of a number of nested nodes. And I've kind of built you the most simple version of a, a web page that you'll actually never find in the wild. But this is a complete web page. If I, you, you save this as HTML, your browser could read it. Um, right? And we have a title that wouldn't actually appear, or rather it would appear here at the top of my browser. And then we have a title. Um, that would appear, and then we have some content. So this could be like some article. And then the question is, well, how do I get systematically? How do I, for example, get to the title here? And the way I think about this is you're just asking for direction exactly the way uh, you would ask for direction if you're coming to a strange city and need to find, say, the city hall. Um, and so what do you do? Well, at every corner, at every note, you tell Zotero, you tell the software to go. So let's say in the previous example, we want to go to the title of the web page. And so what you would say is, and I'm going to scroll back so that you can follow, you take the HTML road, and then you go down, and then you take the body road, and then you go down, and then you take the diff road. OK, so those are directions. The problem here is, though, there are actually two of those diff roads. So we need a way to be a little bit more precise than this. And so there are two uh, strategies uh, that we can use for that. Uh, we can do what many of us would actually do when we give directions. We can say, well, take the first diff road. And we signify that by uh, these little ones in square brackets behind the div. Or we can do something that would be, have, uh, be, be a little bit more reliable, and we essentially uh, use the street name, or in, in uh, HTML talk, the, the attribute. And in this case, if we look up, the attribute was the item prop, and that was uh, called a headline. Right? I'm going to scroll up again so you can see that. Right? We had the div item prop headline. Um, and so this is how our complete XPath would look. And if we had multiple, and that's where this becomes useful, if we had multiple sites that all have the same structure but maybe a different content, this would always find us the headline on uh, that set of web pages. And that's, of course, what we're looking at. If we, for example, want to import from the New York Times, we look at a bunch of articles that all have different content but all have the same structure. This is why we're interested in this. Um, there's just really one more thing that I need to mention. If you can imagine if you've ever actually done the control U thing and looked at a web page, the number of nodes uh, that these have and the level of hierarchy that they have is very long. So if you were to start at um, HTML and then go through the entire structure, uh, you'd spend a lot of time writing these long, long nodes, and no one could read them. Um, what you can do instead is to start your XPath uh, with a double slash. And then it starts anywhere in the hierarchy and just looks for your headlines street or for the diff um, node with the uh, item prop uh, attribute headline. Um, and the, those double slashes actually don't just work at the beginning. You can actually insert, and we're, we're going to see this, you can insert them. Um, in the middle of an XPath 2 that has, has multiple uh, elements. And then, and I think we won't be needing this, but it's uh, terribly useful to know, you can also use for part, uh, to search for part of an attribute. That's this contains that we have uh, here. 
Uh, so if I have, so say, div contains item prop head, that would find headline, but it would also find header. Um, uh, it would find headline one, headline two, something like that. Uh, and so, so if you have kind of this systematic but not always entirely clear structure of your web page, uh, that, that contains attribute is incredibly useful. All right. Uh, one more thing that I uh, want to uh, mention in terms of structure, and that's how well okay, you know about these XPAP things. And these exist all over the programming world. These are no nothing specific to the Zotero. Zotero is a tiny fraction of where uh, they're actually used for. Uh, but, but how do they help us in Zotero? Well, the way Zotero thinks about um, importing web pages is actually in three steps. You always have a target, uh, so you tell Zotero, OK, here's a, web, uh, here's a set of URLs that, that this particular translator, remember, translator always one specific JavaScript file, where this particular translator might be relevant on. Then the next step is a function that every trans, uh, web translator must have, and that's this detect web function. Um, and that is, I'm going to take a look, closer look at the page that is actually open in the browser right now, or the URL that I'm uh, pasting into uh, my Wikipedia site tool. Uh, and I check, is there actually something on the site uh, on that page that I know that I can translate, that I can extract the relevant metadata out of? And then the third step is the do web. Uh, and as that name suggests, that actually runs the translator. So that triggers uh, the function that then actually extracts that uh, data from the web page and passes it on either to your local Zotero database or, in the case of Cytoid, to your Wikipedia uh, document. Uh, so those three elements are in every Zotero translator. And normally, uh, if you write kind of standard code, there are two functions that we um, almost always include, um, and you'll see those later on. The first one is a function that we call scrape, and that's where the actual work happens. So, so all the relevant code that, that, that we'll be writing that scrapes information from the page is very intuitively in a function called scrape. And the second one is get search results. Um, and that's actually less relevant for Wikipedia, but it's very useful for Zotero. If you look on search results pages, you can actually click a button and then select all or any number of the search results to import into your reference manager. And this is a helper function for that. It's not going to be terribly relevant, but we usually want it if you submit translators that are going to run in Zotero. Um, two things. Uh, to keep in mind as you do this, you don't have to start from scratch, right? There are, as I mentioned, 300 of translators, and there are lots of people who have done this and have searched about it, and there's two places I would look. The first thing is uh, that one of my colleagues who helps uh, run the Zotero translators, Philip from Mannheim, he happens to be a librarian, so he catalogs things, which is incredibly useful. And uh, one thing that he has cataloged is, uh, the set of code blocks he uh, uses a lot in his translators. And those are very well written, very standard format, and give you kind of like a, you just have to plug in some values and your translator runs a type of um, structure around where you can work. And the second thing is you can look at translators that actually do something relatively similar uh, to what uh, we want to do. And so, for example, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to scrape some information from a website, and we're going to look at the translator for the German uh, FAZ, so one of the largest uh, daily uh, newspapers, that does just that, and then we apply that to an entirely different site, but we can use a lot of the existing structure. And then the second thing is, and I'll see if we can have time to get to that, but that's very useful, is we find information that's already stored in a format that Zotero knows in the header of the website. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but most websites actually have a bunch of information that's not visible to the user, but that just to computers, Google, 
ser other search engines, etc. And uh, and one example here are, for example, the Public Library of Science Open Access journals that that would be good for that. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of other examples. All right. Uh, so next thing, we're going to actually put this to work. But before I do that, I know I have been racing through this a little bit, uh, or rather mightily. Uh, but uh, I want to kind of give you a chance to let it sink for a minute and uh, maybe ask any questions. And I'll switch my uh, presentation mode so I have broader access. So I'm going to hold for a minute for questions. Hi, that's me, by the way. No questions at the moment? No questions? Ay, 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 ay. OK. No questions at the moment. Uh, all right. Uh, so um, the page that I had, uh, I'm interested to, to look in at today is uh, from uh, one of the more important Argentine newspapers. And I am uh, studied to be you know, a political scientist. And I was very interested in Argentina. So, so these are uh, dear to my heart. Uh, it's called Pagina 12. Um, and it's a very simple, easily structured uh, page. And um, uh, let's get to it. Uh, so I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have this tool called uh, Scaffold that is going to help us with this. And so if you have that installed, it will sit in Firefox here. I already have it open, so it's right here. And um, this, gives, uh, this is how you open this, and this is how it starts. So the first thing it does, it gives us a unique ID for the translator. You can just leave it, or you can generate a new one. Then you give the translator a name. your name. And then uh, we come to the first element uh, that I mentioned, which is the target of the translator. Uh, and uh, so what would work is if I just type in the URL that I see above here, um, and then I can test whether this works. And this says true here on the site. Can everyone see th uh, what I'm doing, or can people see what I'm doing in Scaffold? They yes. get that Perfect. Um, great. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the basically all I need to do. And then it already knows, uh, sees, OK, I want to run this translator on this website. Um, what we typically do is we write uh, what is called a regular expression. And I have help links on what exactly that is. Uh, essentially, it uh, looks at a couple of different options in which uh, strings uh, can appear and has some special characters. So you put in Sebastian? Yes? Sorry to interrupt. Can you maybe zoom a little bit? Uh, uh, I don't know if I can zoom this. Um, this like is in the browser? Like uh, yeah, unfortunately, Scaffold doesn't use the browser. Oh. Um, let me think if I can quickly do this. Um, I'm going to give this one quick valiant attempt. Um, if someone okay. knows. If that's, yeah, if that's not a problem, otherwise we'll find a workaround. Thank you. Nope, sorry. That, that was my only hope, the only hope I had, had, and that unfortunately doesn't affect it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So, so um, what I can do is I can. Um, what would be a good platform to put this on? Uh, right. I'm going to keep a, a Word document or a LibreOffice document uh, open, and then I can put these things here. Highly visible. So that's what I've typed there. 
Um, and what you see is, uh, because, uh, is these backslashes, they escape special characters. If you've never seen a regular expression, you can read up on it. They're incredibly useful. Um, but so this is my target. So every time I'm going to look at uh, a website that has this type of uh, structure at the beginning, uh, my new translator is going to run. Uh, so, so, so that's that's great. And then remember what I said earlier: uh, we can use existing structure, right? Uh, so what I have here is actually the newspaper translator uh, of the mm, of the uh, FAZ, uh, FAZ uh, of that German newspaper. And I'm going to start by just copying um, all the relevant uh, code of that. And then I'm just going to copy that over, and then I'm going to paste it into the code window in Scaffold, which unfortunately is going to be tiny for you. Um, and um, I wish I had uh, a way to make that bigger. I'll, I'll, I think what I'll go ahead and do uh, is I'll just kind of paste important uh, passages again. Uh, and so the top thing here that you see is the detect web fu uh, function that I mentioned exists on every, um, for every translator. And to make things simple for us, uh, we're just going to have that function uh, return newspaper article every time. So newspaper article is one of the item types that Zotero and hence Wikipedia understands. Um, so, so what we have here is this. Um, uh, and uh, now when I click on the little eye icon at the uh, top here, and those have hover over, so if you forgot, you can mention it. Um, the, my scaffold tells me it uh, returned newspaper article. Um, so. Uh, now it, the page loads, and um, and Zotero knows. Okay, we have a newspaper article here, um, and if you have Zotero installed, that actually uh, that actually um, once I reload this page now, I think this will work. It will recognize the pagina dosa here, and you would. Uh, typically see a newspa little newspaper icon here. All right. Uh, so, so this already gets us quite far. We have now we have a set of URLs it's looking at. Uh, it's going to uh, return a newspaper I um, item. We have that do web function here that I'm going to ignore for the time being, because one of the nice things that I mentioned before is we, when we're using standard co uh, code building blocks, we can reuse a lot of things. And so I'm going to focus on that scrape function. That's the third function here. Um, if you open that code um, uh, for yourself, you can kind of follow along. Um, and I'm going to delete almost all of it, except for two things. And I'm going to paste them over to my document again, so you can look at them. Um, so I have this is. This is all I currently have for that scrape function. So this, if you've ever seen JavaScript, just defines, OK, this is a function. And you can ignore that or learn more about functions. Um, and then this just creates a new article. And this says, OK, I'm done with this article. So this would just now save an empty item into Zotero. Not terribly useful, uh, but it already creates us our new items. So, so that's step number one. And now we get to go to work on our uh, expats. And there, the fact that um, the fact that Firefox is really well constructed for developers helps us a lot. So we can right click on the element that we're interested in. And so uh, in this case, we're going to start by being interested in the title, and then select inspect element here. What will happen is. This pane at the bottom of Firefox opens, fortunately also not zoomable. Um, and you see the entire structure of the page here, but in particular, um, you see uh, the, the part that you right-click on highlighted. And so the node 
that we're currently interested in um, is labeled H2. If you do that on the page, and the page is on the link list, so if you want to follow along, you can do that. Um, do the same thing, right click, you, you will actually be able to you know, read this. Um, and uh, what we do then is um, I'm going to start typing this here. This is a little risky because uh, text uh, word processing software, unfortunately, uh, has the, uh, does all types of weird things with text. But I'm going to be daring and do this. So right, we call this a new article. And I'm interested in the title of that. And, then, and that's the most important Zotero-specific function that you're going to use. Uh, they all start with ZU. That's for Zotero Utilities. And then you want the text that's on that XPath. So zu.xpath.text. You're interested in that in the current document. And then XPaths are always in these single or double quotation marks. Doesn't actually matter. OK. I'm going to take this and copy it over to Scaffold. Again, I'm only typing this in LibreOffice so you can see it. Now I need to make sure I fix my single quotes here, because that's one of the horrible things that LibreOffice does to computer code. Um, all right. And I'm going to see what happens if I now run the do web. So I'm now actually telling Zotero to translate this. Um, and you see here a very br uh, brief version of, OK, what do I have here? And it includes the title of that page. So that's already importing. So again, if I imported this in Wikipedia now, uh, it wouldn't get me much, but at least I would get the right title. So that's the start. Um, and then I can go ahead and do kind of the same thing on uh, with the rest of the relevant parts on the page. So I can do the same thing, um, say, with the date. Uh, the date happens to be up here. Um, Right? Uh, so uh, this, again, is nicely labeled. And this is, again, where I mentioned earlier the, your, uh, your um, what should we call it, uh, your kind of directions, your attributes are going to be very useful. And so I um, can write something like, um, the date for my article. Again, same function, works exactly the same way. Um, and now we need to make sure these. The one disadvantage of XPaths is that they're uh, that they're incredibly finicky. So it's an add class. It's uh, and then edition. So you can't mistype. It throws errors. So just to give you now, um, go ahead and paste this in here and run it. It's going to throw me an error. And why did that happen? It happened because I have my Uh, I have the smart quotes still in there. Once I take them out, it uh, should have given me the right pass. And then again, uh, I, I missed a letter. And there we have, we now have the date. Um, and so on and so on. Um, did I get a question there? Yes, there are a few questions if you want to answer them. Yes, let's go. OK. Uh, Marco, do you want to start with yours? Uh, yeah, sure, we can. Uh, so you mentioned earlier uh, that we use this uh, on Wikipedia and that mm -hmm. we run basically our own uh, Zotero server. Um, however, you also mentioned that uh, Zotero needs Firefox to run. Mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a big security issue for us because we do not we do not run uh, Firefox 
in production, but we do run uh, the so-called uh, Zool uh, runner, which is mm -hmm. the kind of core of, of Firefox. And mm -hmm. this is the main disadvantage we have with running Zotero. So we are kind of looking how to get rid of this uh, dependency, basically. So how can we exploit the, the translators themselves uh, without having to uh, have Firefox or Zool Runner as a dependency? So uh, there is the Zotero standalone project. Uh, but it is also that's also client side in the sense that it it binds to your uh, to your browser. So this is not a solution either. It's also uh, it's also Zool Runner, so that doesn't help. Oh 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 okay, yeah. So that doesn't help. No way. Uh, so basically, uh, we want to investigate uh, what it would take to uh, actually create something. Uh, that is not dependent on Zool Runner. Uh, also, I should mention that we use uh, the translation server uh, that is available for uh, Zotero, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Node.js Node uh, server, but that's basically just a translator for Zotero requests. So it's not really a standalone uh, implementation of it. Uh, so besides XPath, uh, are you aware of any like uh, Firefox specific functionalities that are used by Zotero so that we can extract them or maybe uh, extrapolate them somehow not to use Firefox? Um, the trend, well, not Firefox specific. We actually very much try to run the translators uh, with generic code so they can run in any modern browser. But they do, of course, heavily rely on the various uh, interpretive uh, capabilities of a browser, right? You need a fully functioning JavaScript engine with all the, you know, doc evaluate, et cetera, functions. So that needs to be there. Um, but but there's no Firefox specific code. So if you look at, for example, the uh, connectors or the bookmarklet that Zotero runs, that actually runs the entire in most cases, at least, it runs the entire code of the translators in uh, that specific browser, so in Chrome, in Safari, or with some deficits even in Internet Explorer or your mobile browser. Does that answer the question? OK, yeah, to some extent. So uh, basically, uh, we would need to uh, uh, emulate most of the things that a browser can do, like, and we're talking here, maybe uh, cookies, uh, uh, yep. caching, uh, files, CSS, and so on, handling. CSS, but, probably not, but all the other ones, yes. Yeah, yeah, OK, that's true. Uh, OK, but uh, OK. That's, that's good enough for now, yes. Thank you. Great. OK, and I have another question from our IRC channel from user Rinzi. And he asks, I was wondering if there are any plans to standardize the licensing of translators, for example, by chasing down contributors and ask for permission to relicense. Is it now GPL, AGPL, or unlicensed? I just seem to have lost connection. I can hear you. Oh, ah, okay, good. Uh, great. Uh, yeah. So, so uh, Rinza, who 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 is a good friend, asked about standardization of translators. Well, uh, there we're trying to move all translators to the same license that Zotero has, which is AGPL three. Um, but you see here, if, and that's probably why he asked this, this older translator is still under a general GPL license. I think the general goal is to A, standardize, but also to think about a more viable way than uh, individual licenses per translator. So having people uh, sign or agree to some contributor uh, agreement that leaves uh, Zotero um, the flexibility to do things like, say, upgrade to a new AGPL, like to a comparable uh, license in the future, etc. And and I think that's the general goal, but I don't know uh, how far 
uh, we are with that. Uh, in case people are wondering uh, what we are referring to, right? Mo most translators you'll see actually have a specific license um, at the top, and it's mostly either GPL3 or so the GNU public license or the AGPL3, the Afero GNU public license. The letter one is the one that Zotero is using, and so we prefer that. But there is a lot of like ununiformity, some translators without, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a bit of a licensing gray zone, I would say. Okay, thank you. I think that you can go back to your presentation. We will uh, talk later. Okay. Um, I cannot hear you, Sebastian, right now. It looks like you're muted. OK, you're back. I'm, no, I'm back? Excellent. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, so one uh, co key thing that we always want, of course, is the author. The author is uh, uh, Mariana here. Um, this, again, uh, for those of you following along, it's very nicely solved on the, on the website. It's a very structured code. right? The author is, is has its uh, has her own class, uh, so it's p class equals author, and so again uh, we can add the author as um, I'm going to do this uh, here um, and. Uh, Authors are labeled creators, and you'll see that they already exist in the items that I have here on my right side. Uh, and they are in square brackets. Um, in, in JavaScript, those square brackets indicate that those are an object. Uh, so what I do is I, uh, sorry, that those are an array. Um, so I push uh, to that array to add an item, right? And the, th the reason that that is the case is that, of course, Articles can have multiple um, uh, multiple uh, authors, and then I use a specific Zotero function that's Zotero clean author. And then I hope I do this right. I'm going to do this in two steps. So the first thing that I'm actually going to do is I'm going to just grab the authors off the page, right? So I'm going to define an author. Uh, again, do our zux path. Um, and then we said p at class is author, and then a really nice thing that is very good to keep in mind are the debugging functions that Zotero has uh, built in. And I'm going to copy that over for those who can't read along in a minute. Uh, so function, and I can actually use. Uh, that to look at individual variables, for example. So copying this over, what I now added is these two lines of code. So I define a new variable. Um, I grab that variable from the site. And then I'm going to check, OK, what's actually in there. I run this. Um, something went wrong. I probably ah, author in Spanish spelled without a T. Um, so you get all the error messages here, which is one of the nice features of using something like scaffold. You don't have to, you know, save, rerun. You can just do this live, and now it tells me here. Uh, the author of the article, uh, but we get the por, which is the Spanish, you know, by uh, line uh, demarcator first. And so um, what we want to do here is uh, we we want to clean that up a little bit. So um, in JavaScript, we can just simply do nice, uh, right? So we want to uh, search for por at the beginning of my string. 
And then we just uh, want to cut it off. This is what I'm doing here. So, so the cutting it off is just replacing it with an empty string. Those are the, those two. I, um, and that didn't work. Um, there we go. Uh, now my Mariana appears the way she should. Um, and then we can just push that variable um, to, Zotero, uh, to Zotero with this clean author function. And all those functions, I have a link to the documentation. All those functions are specifically documented. So you obviously don't have to remember all of those. You can also look them up in existing uh, translators. And one of the nice things that the clean author function is, it uh, does, it, it takes a best guess at what's the first name and what's the last name. And so our current state of affairs, I'm again going to copy this over for people to see. Uh, our current state of affairs uh, of what this uh, puts out for us uh, is this. We have a newspaper article. We have an author, correct first name, last name. We have a date. Uh, and we have a title. And we have the library catalog we're getting it. Uh, from. And that's actually, for the most part, what we would want from a, a typical article. And uh, what we can do is uh, we can hard code strings. So if I'm looking on that Pahina uh page, I would uh, typically uh, um, you know, know that it's published in, public, uh, in that particular paper. So I can just, in actually string, uh, uh, quotation marks, put the name of the paper and do the same thing with the ISSN. And I looked that up earlier, I hope. Here we have the ISSN. Uh, and essentially, uh, all relevant information that you can uh, think of, of uh, you would like some, you would like to know about an article, uh, you, you should include here. And um, Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so we got, um, it's, I think it's probably, um, there we go. Uh, so, so we got, uh, we got our full, uh, data imported and, um, uh, now we would be ready to go. We could, we could go a little further. So, so one thing that we might want to look at is, uh, are there any keywords on the page? Um, one thing we might want to look at is, is there something that we could use as an abstract on the page that might be useful? So there are other things that I could look at. Uh, but as a basic uh, outline, and more importantly, to kind of get you a sense of how this works, um, this is all, uh, all you really need. Uh, I can save this now. Uh, this is the second button from the left at the top here. And uh, just to show you, I, unfortunately, because the Wikipedia module needs to be updated separately, I can't uh, uh, showcase this in Wikipedia. But what I can do is I can reload the page to re-trigger the translator. And then I can save this down into my Zotero. So in Zotero, the saving works just by clicking that button. And you see here, I hope you can kind of see here, the title, the author, the publication, um, the date, uh, the ISSN. So all the little things uh, that we uh, added. And uh, that's your, your basic uh, Zotero translator and your basic framework for, for Wikipedia. And I think I got a couple more questions. So, so why don't I pause for that? OK. Um, let's see if Marco wanted to ask a follow-up question to the previous one. Uh, yeah, so I was basically wondering if you are aware of any efforts to uh, port Zotero to Node.js for server-side usage, basically. Um, 
beyond the individual components, so the translate, uh, translation server and uh, site prog node, uh, which creates citation, which is less relevant for Wikipedia, um, no. But yeah, no, not, not that I'm aware of. OK, thanks. OK, I'm going to go ahead and ask people on IRC if they have questions that they want me to ask. Um, in the meanwhile, I think I will ask my question. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my question is, is there a way to tell uh, Zotero when uh, some content from a given website is just content? I mean, can Zotero learn the distinction between online material which only appears online on a website and um, material which has also been printed. So for example, <coughs> uh, the website for wealth, wealth.de, um, they have uh, a certain um, URL um, mm -hmm. for things which also appear in the printed uh, magazine uh, newspaper and then they have another um, a different URL of course for things that only appears on their website so can Zotero learn that distinction? Uh, generally the answer is whenever there is something systematic uh, that's different so for example uh, if you have a different URL, as in the case you describe, and I was just uh, clicking through, I'd seen that earlier. If you have an example where uh, where it somehow where it indicates that something is from the print edition, uh, all things like that, Zotero can learn to treat them differently. Yes. Uh, the question is, how would we necessarily treat them differently? So in some cases, uh, I. Uh, think for, for the Atlantic, I used to do that. I tr used to treat stuff that was in the uh, magazine uh, as a magazine article, and everything that was just on the page as either a web, uh, website or a, a blog entry. Uh, that doesn't always make sense, though, because it's still kind of published in the Atlantic, so what does it mean? But, but, the, question, uh, but the answer is, so as a principle, Zotero can absolutely uh, distinguish between the two and uh, as long as the website makes the distinction, right? So in this case, for example, I could probably, I don't know if people can see this, but I can actually make this bigger. This says Edición Impresa, so this actually says print edition here. So I could check if this is here, treat this as a printed article. If this is not there, treat it as a blog entry or something. So yes, absolutely possible. Okay, thank you. That helps a lot. Um, another question from me, and if other people in the Hangout want to interrupt me, they're welcome to do so. Um, so there should be a list um, of uh, of tests, I think, on the Zotero website, uh, but it has been broken for a while now. Um, <laughs> A list, and, and that should be a list of all the Zotero translators and the test, the automatic test. Mm -hmm. But it looks like that page really yeah. doesn't return any useful <laughs> information, uh, and it's been so for a while. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. So the story of that is, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any um, influence on that, unfortunately, uh, but. The story of that is uh, that um, this runs on a little server uh, on the GMU campus. And if that crashes, someone needs to take care of that. And Simon, who this guy, uh, who is the principal architect of this, uh, is in the middle of his PhD. So his time for that, unfortunately, is uh, rather limited. And he has gotten, hasn't gotten to that for a long time. Uh, what is the case, though, and what uh, what is generally quite cool is that you can run the, tech, uh, the tests locally in Firefox uh, using, um, using the URL here. I'm just going to blow this up a little more. Mm, so, so this is this guy. Uh, 
The problem is for the Wikipedia purposes, that's a little trickier because you actually are interested in the server-side tests, and those don't run. And I don't have a good solution for you on that. Um, we, we just kind of need to poke Simon to get this back running. Uh, on, but yeah, um, that, that, that is the story of that. That's the best workaround we currently have available. So you can see the full list and uh, uh, run the tests individually or in bunch on your local Firefox with Zotero installed, but that's, that's it. Can you please uh, add this link to the link list? Yes. Thank um, you very much. We have uh, four minutes. Are there any more questions? OK, thank you so much for the talk. That was great. Uh, we had a whole bunch of people watching online. So uh, looking yeah, forward to sharing the recording further later. Yeah, let me actually finish out by uh, talking about the links that I have at the bottom here. So these are the help resources that I'm offering. So these are the automated tests that I'm going to publish in a second. Um, might as well do so now. Um, Uh, and then uh, there are a couple of things. There's the general Zotero documentation, which is quite technically for writing translators. It's quite technical, but it's comprehensive, uh, especially for web translators. So that's uh, good. I have a couple of suggestions for XPath, uh, for JavaScript. Just look at Code Academy if you want to learn the basics. It's great. For re uh, regular expressions, there are a ton of tutorials. If you have Zotero-specific questions, uh, we have a Google group that we uh, like to re uh, refer people for like more technical coding type of questions to. And there are lots of very, very knowledgeable people. We'd be happy to answer it. Uh, and finally, if you, know, if you do come up with something, uh, don't be shy to uh, put up a, a pull request on the Zotero Translator repository. And that is basically the only way to get it into Wikipedia. And we'll be very happy uh, to work with you. Uh, remember, though, this is production level software. Hundreds and thousands of academics rely on it. Uh, so we are relatively exacting with uh, kind of the final product. Uh, so you'll have to bring some patience, especially as a first time uh, submitter. But we're very excited when we get people uh, uh, to, to add, contribute their code. And uh, we'd be happy if uh, the one or the other of you would, would be among those. And with that, Thank you very much for, for listening, for following along. Sorry for the little script. I hope we can blow this up on the video somehow. And uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, Sebastian.